it's 1030, so we could take this thing off. And we're officially on at 1030 this morning. Um, unusual, but I wanted to share a devotion with you. And uh, I have a medical appointment that uh, conflicts with this uh, devotion. And so uh, I figure if I start half an hour early, I get a prayer and a shared devotion that, uh, you know, we're doing Ephesians 1 word by word. And, um, and so I think we can get it in and still rush down and get to see my eye doctor. And then I have to rush to, to the Bronx and take care of some people. So we praise the Lord. Anyway, God bless you, and we welcome you to our morning devotions. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh, glory to your name. You are the perfect one. You're incomparable. There's just nobody like you. And I have to remind myself of that, Lord, because sometimes we measure you by our own experiences, by who we are, or by whom those who have treated us, raised us, have treated us, and sometimes we think you're like them. But there is nobody like you, oh God. There's just nobody like you. And we give you thanks this morning for the opportunity and the privilege to come to your people and share with them your word, worship together with them, and bless, their, bless your holy name and bless them. And so, Lord, I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters on the other side of the screen that you give them a good morning, a strong morning, a morning of blessing, a morning of grace. And may those who will see this later, oh God, be blessed. Lord, we take chances doing this because the kids are taking all their classes now. And so we pray that we're able to at least uh, provide something this morning and then we give you thanks for everything, the good and the bad. We know you're sovereign and you take care of us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen and amen. Well, my beautiful wife, que linda. Um, she made it down in time for the prayer. Hallelujah. Yes. I see them one. Mm, you did your nails. God, good looking. Hallelujah. God bless each and every one of you this morning. Hallelujah. I've been wanting to sing this song. I think the other day uh, Amy sang it. And I said, wow, how did she know I wanted to sing that song? Lord, I come and I confess bowing here find my rest without you I fall apart and you're the one that guides my
where sin runs deep Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Cause holiness Is Christ in me Christ in me Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, my one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I tell on you Cause Jesus you're my hope and stay And Lord I need you Oh I need you Hey My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my right. Righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need How I need We bless your name, O oh Lord. This morning we praise you, Lord. We give you our devotion. You're the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. There's just nobody. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, just one song, but it's a special song. I hope you heard the, the lyrics of the song. 
We need him every day, in every hour, in every way. There is in the moment, there is not a situation where we don't need the Lord. We're not perfect, and, and we fail the Lord much too often. And uh, we go through days, I suppose, that, um, that I remember there were days that I didn't have devotions, that I just ran my life, that I just ran off to work or just got a quick bite to eat. And I said, Lord, you know, keep me from crashing on the highway. And that was, that was the extent of it. And, uh, and yet he was faithful. And yet he remained faithful. And, uh, and here I am today, uh, a minister of over 44 years. And I can tell you that even when I am unfaithful, he remains faithful. But I can also tell you that his work in my life has progressed and has deepened. And I no longer have those days. I, I've gotten so accustomed to having god fest instead of breakfast god fest and um and i eat and drink of his word every night before going to bed and every morning before brushing my teeth make contact with god and throughout the day i've learned to just practice the presence of god and so i i share that with you so that you might also be encouraged and and strengthen and never quit never quit keep being faithful keep coming back to him he will make a way for you amen well let's quickly because i don't have any confidence that the, the wi-fi will stay on for a whole uh, session because we've got multiple devices going strong this morning um try a little something new let's just say hello to andreita god bless you all the way well, Ruthie is, uh, she's asking me for my sister, Ruthie. Well, she's been on my mind, too. Ruthie is on hospice, and she she's not, um, she's not in any crisis like she was about a month ago where uh, she couldn't eat or anything like that. And so she's still able to eat, and that means that she's still fighting for life, and um and she's somewhat stable. Uh, and we know that her time is short and that it could happen any day. Uh, but only God knows. But she's well taken care of. And um, and uh, she's in all of our prayers every day. Thank you, Andreita, for thinking of her. She loved you too. And, uh, and Pastor Tony loved you so much. And I'm so happy that I get to see your name, and uh, may the Lord bless you richly, Andreita, and all of your sisters. Hey, good morning, Myrna. I missed you yesterday. I'm sure that something must have happened. Maybe I forgot to send you a text, but anyway, it's good to see you this morning, and Ronnie, of course, God bless you, and Edie, and all of those who are on this morning. Amen. We praise the Lord. Well, uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see if I could do this. I, I got, I'm trying to imitate my son. It's amazing, you know. He spent his life trying to imitate me, and now I'm trying to imitate him. Uh, my son Justin is just amazing, and God bless him this morning. Uh, hallelujah. Let's see. Let's see. Yes, I did it. I did it. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. We, we've been going through word by word, Ephesians 1. So you'll see it right there where I'm pointing the finger, right about there. You're seeing the text. Can you see it, Esther? Right. Not yet? Oh, okay. Yeah, there's about 20-second delay. So, um, yeah, we're in um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. You like it? Mm -hmm. Can you read it? Maybe I should use bigger letters, right? Yeah? Yeah. 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 All right. Okay, good. Well, anyway, open your Bibles. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 1. And that's, you don't have to, you know, go anywhere else because we're going through this very slowly, word by word. We covered Paul and what he, what, the, what his name change means. 
We covered what an apostle is, and we're focusing more on the function of the apostle. We made the distinction between the original apostles, of which Paul is not an original apostle, because the original apostles had to be people who walked with Jesus. And uh, this is Peter's criteria, of course. The original 12 were those who were, he chose, and uh, they were there present at his baptism, and then they were present at his ascension. And of course, Paul has a visitation of Christ post-ascension. And he is an apostle because he was chosen and sent by Christ. So that's why he says, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And he starts out, and some version says, of Jesus Christ, and others, Christ Jesus. And this is a peculiarity of Paul. Paul... Um, uh, sometimes put his, his messiahship first, and that's kingdom talk, kingdom talk, because the word Christos, which is Christ in English, Christos in Greek, is the same word that in Hebrew is Mashiach, which is the anointed one. And, um, and Jesus means God our Savior. And so today we're going to go by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Maybe we'll be able to finish it. Who knows? Praise the Lord. So if you're there, we're going to go by the will of God. Um, I'm going to focus not on by because that's fairly explicable and it doesn't make any great change from the Greek to the English, but the word of does. It's a primary preposition. And interestingly enough, it's spelled the same way as the word day in Spanish, dia. And it's pronounced dia, dia, with the accent on the A. And it's a primary preposition denoting the channel of the act. In other words, he didn't appoint himself. But the one who is the channel of the act is the will of God. Now, this is important because in today's age, and on Wednesday night, I, I talk more about that. There are so many apostles and uh, people who use the title of apostle. And uh, I won't spend a lot of time this morning on that because that's what Wednesday's about. Um, uh, we don't know how and why they came up with why they called themselves apostle, but he never called himself an apostle. The one who called them to be an apostle was the will of God. And the one who called them was Jesus. He had a, a, an encounter with the risen Lord and the encounter caused him temporary blindness and perpetual humility. Uh, he was quite an arrogant one and uh, quite a choleric one before Christ. But after Christ um, blinded him and stopped him on the road to Damascus, there is a change in this man that is so dramatic that I, in my estimation, he becomes the greatest Christian that ever walked on the face of the earth the great apostle of the heart set free, the apostle to the Gentiles like you and me, and, uh, and also the apostle of the grace of God. And so he's the channel of the act. And here's the important thing. Whatever you're called to do, make sure God is calling you to do it. And if God is calling you to do it, whether men appreciate you or not, Paul was not accepted by the original disciples. They were leery of him and weary of him. He, he, he came back and he came on too strong. He was so zealous. He started preaching right away. He, he was baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit and no time to waste. And Jesus gave him a mission and he went to do it. And so he's really our, a, a good template for us to follow. We wait too long to start obeying Jesus Christ. He didn't. He went at it. And as a result, they wanted to kill him. And the Christians weren't accepting of him because they didn't know if it was a trick or not. After all, he was the great persecutor of the church and signed off on the murder and assassination of Stephen. And so uh, it's not easy. And he had to go away and he went to the Arabian desert, probably Sinai, and um uh, and there received uh, instruction from Jesus, and Jesus became the one who discipled him and gave him the, uh, the gospel uh, of grace and the gospel to the Gentiles. He gave him the secrets that the 
Old Testament prophets could not. They prophesied it, but they didn't understand it. And Israel, till this day, does not understand it. And that is the mystery. The mystery of the, uh, of the glory of God is that God would become a human being and he would reach Gentiles where Israel would not reach the Gentiles. He did. And so he became the one who revealed this mystery that was hidden for so many hundreds of years. So he's the, Jesus is the channel of rather the will of God. God is the channel by which this apostleship comes on to the apostle Paul. And um, it's, it's interesting because he uses the language of the Lord's prayer. Um, Thy will be done in earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus equated the will of God with the coming kingdom. If the kingdom is not present, then the will of God is not being operated. If your conversations does not bring the presence of God, then those conversations may not be uh, guided by the will of God. If your choices are not choices that are enshrouded, that, that are embraced uh, by the presence of the king, if Christ is not Lord in your life, then your decisions are not necessarily that of the will of God. What Jesus said and we repeated and repeated, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That is the fulfillment of the will of God is that the kingdom should be coming. So that which has been settled in heaven then is fulfilled on earth. So it was settled in heaven that Paul, and Paul later says this in the book of Colossians, that God called him from his mother's womb, that he was not conscious of it until he got saved. But once he got saved, he realized that he had nothing to do with his salvation, that it was all about Jesus. And so he realizes that God chose him from his mother's womb to be an apostle. It is only when you are in the will of God that you understand the mystery of the calling of God in our lives, his sovereignty in everything in our lives. It wasn't an accident that he was born of, a, of an opulent family, a family that had means because he was born free. He had something that none of the other apostles had. He had Roman citizenship. He also was a master of the law, sat under the greatest teacher of his time, Gamaliel. He was a he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. So he came from the very very uh, section that he would then have to make a defense against, uh, not justified by the works of the law, but by faith. It's interesting that God chooses him rather than any of the other ones. Peter was chosen to shepherd the flock, and obviously his gifting, not only an apostle, he was an amazing evangelist. But Paul had all of the ingredients that were necessary to fulfill his calling. That's why it's important to know the will of God, because when you know the will of God for your life, then you will know that he prepared you for that job description even before you got saved. Look at your life, take inventory of your life, find out what appeals to you, find out what you're talented in, find out what you are fire baptized into, and then you can say, God sent me. And so that's an important part of knowing why don't Christians know the will of God in their lives? I guess it starts out with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you submit to a holy God that owns you and every breath you take comes from him, you bow. And so all of your decisions take second, third, fourth, fifth place. God's will is primary. Everything else is secondary. Okay, and then he says, to the saints in Ephesus. To the saints in Ephesus. Well, let's start with Ephesus. I'll tell you why. Because many manuscripts don't have the location. It's left in blank. It says, to, to the saints. And then he continues, so that's left in blank. Um, the reason for that is most likely that the original letter was definitely written to the Ephesians. This is a church that he built, that he spent several years building. He, 
he caused such a ruckus in the this great city by dethroning Artemis, Diana, and the idol makers and burning all of the amulets and books and all of these artifacts that were that were demonic. And he got himself in trouble. Eventually, the Lord said it was time for him to leave. And, and the farewell to this church was a very powerful one. It's found in, in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. And he said that he had fulfilled his mission. Sometimes we need to know when it's time to roll, you know, and it's time to go. And he knew that it was time to go, but he warned them. He told them that, that uh, false uh, teachers and even some among them would not make it. And that's a scary prophecy, but there's nothing in Paul that would let you know that he would be fearful of anything except to do the will of God. And so what this is about is that some the, this, this letter was written to the Ephesians. And, um, but the weightier matters uh, in, in the book uh, were so important to the development. This is really the doctrine of the church. And so every local church needed what he wrote. And so it became a circular letter. Circular letters, like the book of Hebrews, is not meant just to one location. The doctrines that are built on it were, were important to other locations and really all the churches. And so uh, probably some of the copyists left out the word Ephesus because it was going to go to the church of Colossae. It was going to go to the church in, in Sancria. It was going to go to the church of Laodicea. It was going to go to the church of Smyrna. It was going to go to the church of Rome. It was going to go to the church of Corinth and on and on and on and on I go. Those are circular letters. These are letters that are copied and sent forth because the weight of their doctrinal. We know that uh, Romans was not a circular letter, but it became a circular letter because the church fathers had extants or manuscripts of this particular epistle and they were found in different places. So uh, what we do find is that probably all of the letters except the personal letters like maybe the ones to Titus and to Timothy and Philemon, those were personal pastoral letters. They were specifically and, and dated and with instructions for that time, for that place, and just for them. But the general epistles of, of Paul, when I say general epistles, usually that title is left for non-Pauline epistles like James um, and Hebrews. But no, when I mean the, the non-personal ones, the ones that are directed to churches, they eventually became uh, circular. The Corinthian letters, uh, and there were more than two, we only have two, were likely just to the Corinthians because he was addressing some things that were not going on in Philippi. Like when he tells, you know, when he says and he establishes a rule that only one person can speak in tongues at a time until interpretation and up to two and up to three, and then he says, stop it there, that's enough. That is a restriction for the Corinthians because they were abusing the gift. You don't find that in any other instruction to the churches. And he said that he spoke in tongues more than anybody else. So we need to understand that why some letters are local and why some letters are circular. This is a letter that Everything that you read there, every church should know about. And that's why we call it the crowning epistle of church when it comes to the doctrine of the church. So this would be a, a letter that majors in ecclesiology, ecclesiology. And uh, it's because as you could hear the word ecclesia, church, Spanish, iglesia, it, it has a focus on who we are as the body of Christ uh, what is our mission, and uh, what is the nature of the church? Okay, so let's uh, that we solve that issue. Let's move on, and it says to the saints who are in Ephesus. This is interesting because you know that um, many of the high churches, uh, especially the Roman Catholic Church and and the Episcopalian churches, those are considered the high churches even more so than the, than the, but then, then, and when I say Episcopalian, that's the, that's the American version. It's the Anglican church. I'm sorry. I should have said Roman Catholic and Anglican. Um, Episcopalian is the Anglican church in the United States. Uh, in the world, it's called the Anglican church um, because it started in 
amongst the Anglos in Great Britain. Uh, that's why it's called the Anglican, not because they're angels, but because it began in the uh, area where the dominant ethnicity was the Ang Anglos. Um, so they venerate their saints. You know, you wait several years, some may maybe even some hundreds of years, and the renown of some people are such, um, you know, you hear about St. John of the Cross, you hear of St. Teresa de Avila, you hear of St. Anthony of Padua, you hear of people that were venerated and some are considered uh, 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 saints of a higher caliber and because the Roman Catholic and even the Anglican has a spot little entrance where they believe that these saints have a, a greater access to God in the heavenlies and that they can serve as semi-mediators. The Catholic Church says that the Virgin Mary and these saints, all of the apostles, definitely uh, serve as mediators. In other words, we're not holy enough to even address God, uh, and we're not even holy enough to address Jesus, so we need their help to mediate for us. And of course, that's not a biblical uh, uh, doctrine at all. And, and Martin Luther just repelled against that and uh, basically established the universality of the priesthood of every believer. Every believer has access to the Holy of Holies. But one, one good thing that they did do is that they recognized men and women. And it's interesting because women are usually not recognized, but they recognize men and women who whose lives were to be emulated and they they, they experience something. In the Catholic tradition, for them to be canonized, they not only had to live a, a, a rep, replicable life, uh, a model life, but they had to have been used of God in some kind of supernatural act, uh, some healing or something. Uh, um, that is not the biblical definition of saints. That is not. So we can write saints with a, a small letter. We are all saints. Saints means, and let's get to it, the word saints there is agios or hagio. That's where the, the name hagiai, hagios, comes from. It means to set apart the separated ones, those who have been called apart. And every believer has been called apart out of the world and into the body of Christ. And so all those who have been separated by God are to be called saints. And it's interesting because Paul writes to the saints in Corinth, and then he rebukes them for incest. He rebukes them for pride. He rebukes them for divisions, uh, for gossip. Um, he rebukes them for abuse of the gifts of the Spirit. And, and you, when you read the, what's going on in Corinth, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's a scandal. The, the church, the Corinthian church was scandalous. And yet he called them saints because although they were involved in sin, they had received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He's a witness to that because he's their father in the Lord. He's the preacher that God used to establish this church. And so he knows whereof he speaks. But he also knows that unless we are progressively and continuously sanctified, we tend to go back to our old ways. And so it is important to understand. And that's why I picked the song that I sang uh, today uh, in the beginning. That sanctification, uh, which means that which is devoted by to God. When when we sanctify things in the in the temple, like the pulpit, the altar, we sanctify it. So we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing things on that pulpit and that altar that defile it, that's, that does um, damage to that which it was dedicated for. And so um, we, 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 um, when, we, when we sanctify something, what we're doing is we're devoting it. Um, this guitar is sanctified for worship. And, and uh, although I, I play all kinds of music in it because worship to me is not the music or the rhythm, it's the heart. And, and, and the words that I bring up to God, but it's dedicated for that. And these mics are dedicated for that. And so when you sanctify something, you separate it. It's like some of the pots and pans that I have there. I told my wife, you shouldn't do this with a, a new pan that I bought. And she forgot or she probably didn't hear me. And it, it cracked because I wanted it devoted just for me. 
<laughs> and it needs to be dried and treated. You know, I, I have an iron cast. I have two iron casts. And uh, when she doesn't take care of it, I go, oh, God, because, you know, iron cast, if you don't dry it, if you don't season it and, and prepare it, it gets, you know, it gets rusty and it, it's horrible. And, and you don't want that in your food. So you got to constantly take care of this. So it's separated for certain things. And I didn't mean to, you know, make fun of her, but I kind of like doing that because it makes her smile. You just don't know how much she makes fun of me all day long, all day long. So I'm just trying to get even and not, not quite. We're just having fun. So sanctified means that which is devoted to God. Okay, so sanctification, it's important that we get through this. Sanctification is number one positional. I am in Christ, like the song says. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. And then it says, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, is in you. My righteousness is as filthy rags, but we are in Christ. So that's called positional positional sanctification we are hidden in christ we come before the father in the name of jesus he does not see us he sees christ we come in jesus name and so we are sanctified that's why the corinthians could be called saints because they were in christ even though they were not behaving like someone in christ number two progressive sanctification. That's what the Corinthians were lacking. That's the work that the Holy Spirit continually does. He continually brings the cross into our life. Those bad attitudes, that pride, that arrogance, that immorality has to be crucified on the cross. Who gets us there? The conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so every day the Holy Spirit should be convicting us. Every day the Holy Spirit should be guiding us. Every day he should be applying the death of Christ into our lives. He applies the death of Christ into my vocabulary. I no longer speak like one I used to speak before the Lord. I no longer curse people out and send them to Timbuktu and I have other exquisite words because I'm a Puerto Rican and you know we have those words, right? But we shouldn't use those words. Those words are not our vocabulary anymore. And who convicts us of that? The Holy Spirit. And just when we're about to use it just about when somebody cuts us in in the highway or just about when somebody stamps on our toes and ah we come out with a la 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 la, la. yeah the holy spirit convicts us and says that's not how jesus speaks and it's a continuous it's an unfinished but it's progressive it should be progressive we should not be the same as we were when we first came to christ there should be some progress in our lives and number three it's the perfect sanctification that cannot happen until jesus comes because when he comes he will change us he will transform us and perfect sanctification there's another word for perfect sanctification in theological language and it's called glorification when the glory of god comes upon us it changes us he gives us a new body the flesh that is always leading us into sin is eliminated and we are re we receive a new body whereof we will glorify him and serve him for the rest of eternity that only happens in the sound of the trumpet at the twinkling of an eye when we shall be transformed and we shall be like Jesus. So to be a saint means to be in Christ, receive him by faith, to progressively allow the Holy Spirit to change you and transform you, and to be expecting, as Elder Nancy preached this Sunday, be expecting the coming of the Lord, that longing for that change. And when I, and when I minister to people who are dying and have served the Lord for many, many years, they no longer want to hold on to this life. They're just, they're just beginning to see, and sometimes in their talk, they talk about things uh, of heaven, and they're ready to go, and they're not attached like we are to this life. The Lord begins to break away that attachment to, to these things. And, and when you see people who, who don't want to die and, and, and they're, you know, they're on stage four, stage five, stage six, whatever it is, 
maybe we should minister to them. And right now, Elder Nancy's ministering to a dear friend who needs Jesus because he's on his way out. And, uh, and we're, we're praying for him. Uh, and so um, his name is Billy Luciano. So pray for him that Elder Nancy would reach him today. She's, her mission today is to go where he's at and preach the gospel to him. All right, so that's important. All right, so he says, to the saints in Ephesus, to those who have been separated, devoted to God, and are faithful. Ah, here comes another qualifier. This is an adjective. In Greek, it's pistos. Remember that that, those, that double T is pi. You remember from math that, that 3.14 pi. Well, that's the letter pi. And so it's pistos. And that's the word for faith or faithfulness and the word faith and faithfulness are used interchangeably so faith means to be faithful to the word of God to be faithfully following God and so and to those who are faithful oh it's an adjective which is descriptive what does an adjective do it describes a person place or thing in this case it's the saints so It describes the saints at Ephesus. What was their characteristic? That they were faithful. Not only were they separated to God, devoted to God, devoted to following Jesus. This is the basis of discipleship. This is why some people never grow, because they don't understand that you have to be devoted to following Jesus. Not just the day you went to the altar and asked him to forgive you of your sins, but every day be devoted to him and to be faithful in following him. And so it's a descriptive adjective. The saints are the separated ones, devoted to God and following Jesus, and yet remain faithful. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. And then he ends. So we finish verse 1. Pretty good. I'm almost ready to go. I got to go change and run to the doctor. In Christ Jesus. In Christ. Faithful in. Now I'm going to focus on the word in. The word in, in Greek, is en. And it's the same word in Spanish, en, en. And it's a preposition. Ah, it's a primary preposition which denotes a fixed position in place, in time, and state. In other words, these Ephesians were so devoted to Christ, so set apart for Christ, that they fixed themselves in Christ Jesus. They didn't, you know, one day I'm going to serve the Lord and one day I'm giving up. One day I'm going to serve the Lord. No, they were fixed no matter what came. Even if they failed the Lord, they would confess their sins and, and ask God to forgive them, but they were never, never looking back. I'm not going back. No, no, no. I am fixed in Christ Jesus. And I'm fixed at the, from, uh, in, into the time that he saved me. And I'm fixed into the state I'm in the state of faithfulness. And, uh, and by implication, the instrumentality. And that means how can we become faithful? What is the instrument that God uses to keep us faithful? Uh, medially, that means by means of, constructively, meaning act, active in our lives. And, and it, it means more or less to, it's a relationship where you rest on someone, well, that someone is, is Messiah, the King, Christ. That's what Christ means. King, King Messiah, Jesus, my Savior. So I rest on what he did. I fail the Lord. I come back to him. I never go back. I go running to the Lord. I don't go back to the world. I go running to the Lord. I ask him to forgive me as many times as I have to, and I rest in what he did, what he accomplished on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. So who is Paul writing to? To people who knew that they knew that they knew that they were the church of the living God. And you, my friend, needs to know that you know that you know that you are part of the church. Not because you're perfect, but because you've been set apart. You're following Jesus, and you remain faithful because he is faithful. This is what Paul wrote, even when we are not faithful, Jesus remains faithful. Amen. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. I hope that this has been edifying to you. 
Vicky Valdejo is Pastor Rick's wife, and I spoke to her on Saturday. We've been praying and praying for her because she's afraid of losing her eyesight. She has severe glaucoma. That's what I'm going to the doctor for, so this this is ministering to me. Um, she's had multiple operations, and and we're just hoping in God. And she went through a hard time, the pandemic, not being able to come to church and and not able to see, and they had to operate like back to back because something went wrong. But Saturday I spoke to her and she had faith and she sounded so much stronger. So let us continue to pray for her. Also our sister Ruby Davenport, a dear member of our church who has been sent home because the cancer in her body is inoperable. And, um, and also we wanna pray for uh, Denise Smith, her uncle Ivan that we've prayed for all this time passed away. He is now in glory. He was very grateful that we prayed for him. And the Lord extended his life through this pandemic. And uh, But now he's with the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Our brother Benny Mejias, he needs a new liver. And um, it's really, really hard. The liver has been damaged um, irreparably. So he may need to be a candidate for a liver transplant. And that is very costly and not everybody qualifies. Uh, what we want is for God to do a liver transplant. And uh, I think of him and I think of Anibal Torres, same situation. A little further, uh, more deteriorated than Benny, but yet still alive and serving the Lord. Uh, we want to pray for all of our elderly folks because we are now in flu season. Combine the flu with COVID, not a good combination. So our elderly will probably be less likely to come out. We've had quite a few of them come out to our services and they've been bold and many of them have gone out witnessing but now as the weather changes and the flu season comes in it might be wise for them to to stay in and so we want to pray that this this does not become tragic our sister Dimari her children Eddie and Nisa their father um, who needs to come back to Jesus uh, is not in good health they also had a tragic murder in the family, a nephew of their father um, was murdered and, and burned. It's a horrible thing. Our brother Hector Rosario's brother, Richard Rosario, who lives in Connecticut, has been diagnosed with liver cancer. They found a tumor in his liver, and the medicine that they tried first did not work, and so they're evaluating what measures they will take, and we're, we're, we're not evaluating, we're bringing him to Jesus. In Jesus' name. We also want to pray for all the people who are getting laid off, the city budget and the state budget, uh, since the federal government is taking so long to um, give another help due to this pandemic. Uh, there are cuts, and so uh, people will probably be receiving layoffs, and, um, you know, it, that's horrible at this time. Also, our sister Jeannie Delgado, our discipleship teacher, leader in the church and the women's fellowship. Her stepmother, Iris Velez, um, she is dependent on medicines for because she's, she's a kidney transplant patient. She received a kidney, and those medicines keep that kidney working. They were lost in the mail in this horrible pandemic, and they haven't yet either replaced the medicines, and she has to return to Puerto Rico because she cares for Jeannie's dad. Jeannie's dad needs a caregiver. And so we need that situation to be resolved. And also her, her husband, Joe's oldest sister, Jeannie Delgado's sister-in-law, Frances, has a very weak heart. And also we want to pray for uh, all those that, um, you know, uh, I mentioned um, Sister Nancy, who's going to go visit Billy Luciano. And, and there are a lot of people with cancer. And so we want to pray for them in the name of Jesus. And also my brother Nelson, who I didn't see on, I don't know, maybe he's on. But uh, he's been having a tough time. He, didn't, he wasn't even able to go to the, uh, and he was supposed to work this Saturday at the church doing the cameras. And uh, he was too sick. And so his situation with his heart is... Um, getting delicate and so and he's part of this family here so let us pray for him 
Father in heaven, we thank you for the stability that you give us, that we can live this Christian life, Lord, knowing that we always have a place to go to when we fail you, when we're not right. We can always come to you because you're faithful even when we're not faithful. Lord, let us, let us be dedicated and devoted and separated from sin and separated from this world. And let us be united with you in victory, O oh God. We pray for these that we've mentioned. We lay hands on these petitions. We trust you, Lord, to meet the needs of each and every one of them. Heal the sick in Jesus' name. Those who have the coronavirus, those who have cancer, those who are struggling with glaucoma, those who are recovering from surgery, those that are struggling in their faith, those who are, are struggling financially, oh God. We pray your provision. We pray your strength. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, our president, our senators, oh God, those that are running for this new election, oh God. We pray for each and every one of them. We pray for our governor, and we pray for our mayor, and we pray for our representatives, oh God, in Congress and in the city hall. We pray, oh God, that you give them wisdom. Wisdom, oh God. We pray against the violence in the street and the bigotry, oh Lord, in every strata of society. We come against it in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, for this precious opportunity to come live on Facebook and share your goodness and your love. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. I gave my life to Christ I gave my life to Christ And it made all the difference in the world Oh, I gave my life to Christ Gave my life to Christ And it made all the difference in the world Oh, it did My life's so broken And it put the pieces together again and he took my sins and put them in the deepest of the ocean. And he said he'd be hugs his friend. That's why I gave my life to Christ. I gave my life to Christ. And it made all the difference in the world. Oh, I gave my life to Christ. I gave my life to Christ. And it made all the difference in the world. Oh, well, he took my life so broken. And he put the pieces together again And he took my sins and threw them in the deepest of the ocean And he said, I'll be closest friend How oh could I give my life to Christ? Gave my life to Christ And all the words within the world Oh, I gave my life to Christ I gave my life to Christ And it made all the difference in the world Oh, I gave my life to Christ, gave my life to Christ, and it made all the difference in the world. I gave my life to Christ, gave my life to Christ, and it made all the difference in the world. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, amen. I was just looking while I was trying to sing at the same time. There are some prayer requests that were added. Please look at the comments. And pray for our brothers and our sisters, our sister Olga out of Joseph. We have been praying for him, and he had a heart operation, uh, I think a multiple, a quadruple heart surgery. Everything went well, and we just continue to pray for his complete healing. Um, I think someone else asked for prayer. Uh, let's see. Was it Maribel? Yeah, I think it was earlier. Amen. Something okay. Uh, says that my brother's back to work and renting a basement at my older brother's home. Well, that's an answer to prayer. Praise the Lord. Okay. I remember that. Amen. And, and the older brother took him in and now he's back to work so he could pay. Praise God. And, you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned it here uh, recently, but Michelle Solomon, whom we prayed for so much, she actually was denied twice. And then the third time, the Lord came through. She's kept, now we just need to pray that she get employed so she can continue to pay her bills and, and um, do her thing, amen? And so, hallelujah, God bless you all, and uh, if I didn't greet you, 
Uh, I'm kind of in a rush. I'm, I'm going to a doctor's appointment. God bless you. Keep you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day in the Lord. Amen.